in doing some study of history that a lot of the gospel was spread by testimony, by word of mouth. And it was just one person sharing what somebody else had shared with them. And through the sharing of the gospel with that person, salvation had came. By the individual preaching and sharing of the power of the name of Jesus and what Jesus Christ had done for me and you. They didn't have a lot of written word. It was all just word of mouth. And somebody said, well, how in the world did they get the gospel around the world? That's the power of the gospel. And that when it affects one person, it just starts. And I'm going to tell you all you really got to have. You don't have to have a Ph.D. or a master's in theology. You just got to know about the power of the name. <laughs> Amen. There's power in that name. To save to the uttermost. In the book of Psalms in chapter 85, I want to try to just sort of catch up or connect back where I was left off last Sunday. And we had spoke a, preached on a message, Renew My Strength. I don't know if you heard this, uh, if you, it's on social media, on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. But I just really felt like when I got home, I just did not cover it efficient, effectively. And I woke up this morning, it had to be around 2.30, which I don't think the time got me kicked off that bad. But I'm laying in the bed really praying about the message for today and had really spent some time on something else, but God really brought me back to this. And I believe God's going to minister to you today. In Psalms chapter 85 and verse 6, he said, Will thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit and your anointing, Lord, that arrests upon us to declare your word this morning. May we be very sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit, the direction. Speak unto our hearts this morning, Lord. Revive us again, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Will thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? And I just want to share this with you for a few minutes. I just want to lay something down, maybe a little foundation here. Because the word revive is to return to life. It gives really the impression in our mind of something that is dying or something that has already died. And probably to the strength of the word revival and the strength of the power of God, we may want to just look at it not of something that is dying, but something that has already died died. And it carries me back in my mind just to really grab a hold of this word revival or revive. I don't know what you get from this. Sometimes we have referred to it as revivals of just having a little get together or certain time of the year where we had special singers and special music and special preachers. But I want to tell you, if anything is to be revived, it's going to come by the power of God in Him alone. And it carries me back to a story. I just think this best gives the definition of this word revive. And I want you to grab a hold of this. Because no matter where you're at, he is able to revive. You're not past the point of no return. You are not past a point that no one can help you. And when I say no one, I'm not referring to myself or to somebody else. I'm referring to a specific someone, and his name is Christ, Jesus the Christ, the Redeemer. 
He is able to revive. He is able to restore. And so you go back to this story in the book of Ezekiel. Anybody ever read Ezekiel chapter 37? I think it just really gives the the utmost definition of this word revive. Because when you look over here in Ezekiel chapter 37, there Ezekiel walks out and he sees a valley of dry bones. Now let me go ahead and say this. He does not see a valley of dead people. He sees a valley and not just of bones, but of dry bones. In other words, they have laid there for so long, there is no longer any kind of resemblance of anything of any kind of man or a woman. They are just dry fragile bones that have been laid out in the sun. And I like what the Lord had asked Ezekiel. He says, can these bones live? Uh, Like there was some kind of quick uh, trick question. But I think uh, uh, Ezekiel just takes the the point. He says, Lord, you know whether they can live or not. And I want to tell you this morning that we know through through the history of this that God is able to raise up things that have died. And it was here at the valley of these dry bones. This is an army. This is a nation. I like to look at it as a nation of Israel. And while I got a chance here, I'm going to say this this morning. That when you look at the nation of Israel, you see the redeeming hand of the Lord. That no matter how many times someone has tried to destroy them, they still can't come back. And you see this in this nation. And for the naysayers, I just want to tell you that what's going on over there in Israel today, when it's said and done, Israel will still be standing. It's a testimony to the power of God. So when you look at this valley of dry bones, you see this army that has died. You see this nation that has been... uh, has just sort of disappeared. And man, what is going to happen? Is God able to revive something that has gone this far? And the good news is that we know the history of this story because when we begin to look at it, the Lord had spoke to Ezekiel and told him to stand out. I can see him standing on the edge of the mountain. And he tells him to begin to prophesy. In other words, begin to release the word of God. And I want to tell you there's power in this word. There's power in the word of God. And as he speaks over this valley, he's just releasing what the Lord has spoken unto him. And as he's doing so, there's all of a sudden now in the midst of the power of God's word going forth, there is a shaking or what I would like to call a trembling in the valley. And what I mean by that is we're starting to hear something starting to move. Even though there's still dry, dead bones, they're starting to move a little bit because the power of the, of the Word of God has an effect upon that which was dead. And we see him begin to prophesy, and all of a sudden bones begin to move and they begin to line back up. But in the midst of this, we see where now there appears to be an army, an exceedingly great army, but it's no life in them. And then he tells Ezekiel, he says, I want you to begin to prophesy unto the winds. And he tells him to speak unto the winds from the north, the east, the south, and the west. And all of a sudden, there's something that blows into this valley and life comes into this valley there was a wind there was a breath that came in this valley we get our word when you look at the word spirit it comes from the word wind breath to breathe We find out in the book of Genesis when God created man and he formed him from the clay of the earth, what did he do? The man had an appearance, but he was not living. And then he breathed upon him. 
And so you see through the breath of God that now man has come alive. We, we find this word wind or breath and you can start to weave it all the way through the Old Testament on into the New Testament. I have found out that in the midst of everything that we're doing and what all is going on, if there's anything that needs to happen today, Lord, we need revive us again. Oh, Lord. Revive us again. And my cry is this morning, as we begin to cry, revive us. We're not speaking of someone else. We're speaking of ourselves. Lord, revive me again. Move in my life in a mighty way. Lord, I need you. Last week when we left off, I was talking about the battles that we go through. And how many of you face battles? The Bible says this, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Wrestling has to do with grappling with one another. Trying to put your opponent into a position that we would say that they would tap out. We also started last week from the book of Galatians in chapter 6 and verse 9 where Paul said, Do not be weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall reap if we faint not. And I really believe that he put this here for a reason. He did not put do not be weary there for nothing. He, t- he put that there because there is a chance. There is a possibility of us becoming weary in what we're doing. Just becoming a heaviness upon us. It's just something that's trying to take the breath out of you. I don't know if you've ever been played on the playground before or not. And maybe you're just running around if you ever played any kind of sports. But I'm going to tell you, you can tell when the breath has been knocked out of you. <laughs> you will think for a moment, I think I'm about to die. <laughs> if you never had the breath knocked out of you, you're sitting there trying to breathe, but you're just absent. A breath. And this is what the adversary is trying his best to do. Just to knock the breath out of us. To a point that the church or individual just come to a place that we feel defeated. That we feel helpless. And maybe even to a point that says, you know what, I think I'm just at the point that I just don't know whether this fight is even worth it. Let me share this with you this morning. This is something that is happening in the churches of America today. There has been a lick that has been landing. It's like it has taken the breath out of us. We can see it in the zeal and the passion of our worship. In our testimony, we can see it. We always refer him back to what God has done and not what God is doing. There was something that I missed last week that I really want to cover. And it's recorded in the book of 1 Samuel in chapter 30. In chapter 30... There was something here that I did not make mention of that I had down that I thought that I had it as an important thing that I wanted to cover. We find out in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 30, that David and his men, there is a city there called Ziglag that has been given unto him. Anybody know about this? If you have it, I'm going to just give you a brief overview of this. That now he has tried to go into battle and he says, David, we don't need you. Just go back to Ziglag. And he had left his family there. He had left his 
kids there. He had left his cattle there. Everything that he had and his army had was in a place called Ziglag. And there is not only a battle going on with the Philistines, there is a battle that has been taking place in Ziglag. And the enemy, the Amalekites, had come to invade Ziglag and take all of David's stuff. The Bible says that he had been smitten there. That there was a blow that had been delivered. Not a fatal blow, but a blow that had just taken really the life out of him. A blow that would disable him. A blow that had come to his way that you would just sort of come to a place. I don't even know if I can make it through this or not. And in the midst of this, we find out as they came back, all David's wife is gone, David's kids are gone, his army, his, their wives are gone, and now they are threatened of stoning him. I don't know if you've ever been like David was in this position, but I'm telling you, there is a weight that started to grow upon him. Are you with me? There is a, a, there's a blow that has hit him one after another. Not only is my family gone, but also my army's family is gone. And now the army that has been behind me has now gone, got together and now they're speaking of stoning me. And there was this word here. He said he was distressed. It's in the... 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6, And David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him because of the souls of all the people was grieved. Every man for his son and for his daughter. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. I want to go right back here just a second. Because we find out here he was greatly distressed. Not just a little distressed. He was greatly distressed. Distressed. And what did this mean here? Because the more I began to look at this, it carried me all the way back when it talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but up against powers and principalities and how this spirit of weariness is just trying to hold you and stop you and literally take the life out of you. And we find out here this word distress means to be wrapped, like something has done wrapped around you. Oh my. It means to tie up or to lock up. It means to restrict it. It also means to constrict. It gives the impression of something that has wrapped around you and will not let go. And the more that you move and the more that you do something, it tries to continually just choke the life out of you. You're not with me this morning. If you watched any old shows where they begin, you start to see what a python or a, some snake like this, what does he do? The way that he takes the life out of you is to wrap around you and he is just trying to squeeze the life from the inside of you out. In other words, he is trying to deliver a blow that is going to take all the air out of you. And this is where David was at. We can see this. Oh, it, 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 just compressed and constricted and just trying to squeeze the life out of this man. Have any of you ever been there? Maybe you're facing these things. And every time that you think that you get one step ahead, it seems like you have to take two steps back. And I'm going to just be honest with you this morning. I'm going to be real with you. Because no matter who you are, it's just a matter of time that even on the strongest of persons, if you're not careful, taking one step forward and going two steps back just pays a real big toll upon your life. You could see. I want to tell you, there's probably a vast majority that's dressed up pretty good this morning. And you're hiding a lot of things. But you have found yourself in the position where it feels like the very life is trying to be pressed out of you. The word depressed, you, it, the best example of this is, is to look at a basketball. And if I was going to depress it... It would be to take the lid off of it or take some kind of the, the uh, 
cap off of it and press down upon it to move all of the air out of it. Oh my. Is anybody with me? That's what it means to depress or, or to constrict. Just taking off the top and pushing from the outside to trying to remove what is on the inside. And what is the devil after? He's after that breath. Oh, he's after your testimony. He's after your shout. He's after, he's after that word. He's after everything that's on the inside of you. Let me just continue and try to put the pressure from the outside and try to take every bit of life that's in him out. Oh, my. You ever been there? You find yourself here, and you're asking yourself, what do I do, Pastor? And you know something? I'm also going to be straight up with you on this. Not that I ain't messed right up on the rest of the stuff. There's a vast majority of people that find themselves there. There's a vast majority that fill in our churches across America that the life has just done been sucked out of them. How did this happen? First of all, it was an assignment. There was a spiritual attack. And what has happened for so long, we have, we have been really good at diagnosing the problem, but not giving the answer. I want to tell you, I, I thought about this because you ever been to the doctor and you walk in? I don't know about how your doctor is. And I, I do know a good bit about what's going on with me. Probably nobody knows no more about what's going on with you than you do. But you walk in and the doctor starts asking you questions. And I'm thinking to myself, doctor, I come here for you to diagnose me. <laughs> because I, I can tell you what's hurting and aching. And we have come really good at telling and diagnosing the problem. Oh, that you're in a warfare. And the preachers have told you you're in a spiritual war. Nobody had to tell you this morning when you come into this place that you're in a spiritual battle. Nobody had to tell you that. I didn't have to spend the first 15 minutes of this message telling you that. You came here already knowing that I am in a spiritual battle. And it seems like there has been a pressure applied from the outside, just literally exhausted me of life. So what is the answer? I'm glad you, answer, you ask. I like what David said because along the line, you just got to come to the place where David was at. That David had examined the, the situation. He seemed where the very life of everything he had was being pressed out of him. He had also seen where his men were threatened of stoning him. You can just see how this is building up with David. And you can see where he's at. And he's, David was a man that had done tried a lot of things. When you go back and look at his past, he done tried all the ups and downs and he done tried all the three-step programs. But what David had learned through his life, he said, I know a man. And this is when David said, I will encourage myself in the Lord. There's something unique about this. And I want you to turn with me to the book of John. Give me 10 more minutes here because there is an answer to this problem. The disciples in John chapter 14, Jesus is getting, the disciples had been with Jesus now for several years and they had put a lot of faith and a lot of trust in him. Boy, they were dependent upon him. And all of a sudden, Jesus is getting ready for the crucifixion. He's getting ready to go to the cross. And he begins to tell his disciples, starting in chapter 13 of John, that I'm about to go. 
And I'm about to go and I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to be resurrected. And I am going to ascend into heaven. I don't know what they had on their mind, but I don't think their game plan was the same thing as Jesus' game plan was. And all of a sudden, when they find out that, that Jesus says, I'm going to be crucified, you can already tell that there's a little bit of steam coming out of them. You can already tell that, oh man, there's something grabbing a hold to them. The very breath of life is trying to come out. I, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? But Jesus makes this great comment, and we know about it because Jesus had made the comment to them he said I have prayed to the father and he says that he would send another comforter is anybody with me here Where to, what is this comforter who is this comforter what is he if we read a little bit later on we're going to find out that he defines who the comforter is and the comforter is the Holy Ghost he said I am going to send another unto you you can find yourself in despair you can find yourself with a life just literally brought out of you man it feels like I can't go any further but Jesus had told the disciples he said is, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Oh, I just want you to keep your faith. This is what Jesus is telling us. I'm, I just need you to keep your faith in the proper place. Oh, is anybody with me? Keep your faith in me. Keep your eyes upon me. He said, I have prayed to the Father, and he shall send you another comforter. The word comforter is a, a helper. I said the word comforter is an encourager. The word comforter is someone to guide you. The word comforter is someone to console you. The word comforter is someone to encourage you. And Jesus said, I'm going to send you another. In other words, Jesus was telling the disciples here, he says the same thing that I have been to you because I have been your comforter up to this period. But he also said, I'm not going to leave you comfort less is anybody with me I said, is anybody with me this morning? <laughs> oh, when you find yourself, what do we do, pastor? It seems like, man, every time I turn around, Satan's just trying to pull the air out of me. Y'all stay with me just a minute. He said, I will not leave you comfort less. <sighs> Ooh, my, my, my. What does this mean? Let me say it. He will not abandon you. He will not abandon you. The word comfortless is where we get our word orphan. And that comes from a place that when a young child was born, that the this, this, the passing away of his mom and dad would leave him a orphan. In other words, he wouldn't have anybody to help him unless just somebody came along. He was left abandoned. Nobody wanted. But Jesus told the disciples, I'm leaving, but another one. Another one. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to leave you in the condition that you're in. He says, I am going to send an encourager to you. Someone to empower you. Someone to guide you. Someone to direct you. Oh my. We find out. Y'all still with me? We find out when we get to the book of Acts. When something has been deflated or depressed, remember what I told you, to press in and move everything out. The solution for this is a sudden burst of air or breath or wind. The solution to something where all the air is gone. What would cause something that had been absent of air 
to be revived. A sudden burst of air. So when Jesus looked at disciples, he told them this in the book of Matthew in chapter 24 and verse 49. He said, go tarry in the city of Jerusalem till you be in due, till you be in clothed, till you be empowered. And we find out in the book of Acts. Let me go back just one second. When something has been deflated, when something has had all the air pressed out of it, the solution to this is a certain burst of air, breath, or wind. This is the word spirit. You can just go back and look it up. It's where we get our word pneumatic, power air tools. Numos. And this is the same word that was used in Genesis. It was the same word that was used in the valley of dry bones. Air. Breath. So we get our word spirit. And the spirit of God began to move. And now we go to the book of Acts. See, there's something different today. Let me just, 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 there's something different today. There's something different today. Lord, help me here. The Old Testament dealt with the Spirit coming upon them. But since the New Testament, the New Covenant, the Spirit does not come along beside them and come upon them at certain times or seasons. The Spirit has come to dwell in you to empower you. My Lord. And so on the day of Pentecost, there was something that happened. He said, they were assembled together in the upper room. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Remember what we're talking about, being deflated. He said, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And this is the promise of the Father to me and you. Lord, revive us again. Revive us again. This is the power of the Holy Spirit because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ has put us into this position. And not only has the Holy Spirit come to fill us, He is filling us. You're going to find out as you go through the book of Acts, you're going to find out that these disciples were continually being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to stand your feet this morning. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for today. I thank you for this opportunity and time to come and to preach your word. Lord, we thank you for the power of the gospel, the very shed blood of Jesus Christ that has been shed for us. And, Lord, we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. Lord, there's men and women here this morning That is just struggling. It's going through spiritual battles, Lord. And I'm asking that the Holy Spirit move mightily here. And there, may there be a cry, Lord, revive me again. 
Lord, I need you. The task is too big. The blow's been too powerful. Lord, I need you. When it comes down to it, victory comes only in the blood and him alone. But me and you, just like David, leaning on Christ and him alone. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord, for this morning. I pray, God, for healing in this house today.